Well, I've tried. Okay. I've given this a try a couple times now to record this um, about visual persuasion and your upcoming week's work. So I'm going to try it again. Um, hopefully, it's recording. So let me just share my screen. Here. And in this week, Lester talks about visual persuasion and the difference between persuasion and propaganda. Obviously, I can't do that. So let's just take a look at this. Kind of go over what some of the highlights that he talks about and see how it fits into what we're doing. Visual persuasion is really just um, an image that appeals to your emotions and your intellect to help shape your perspective or change your mind, um, promote a particular desired behavior. Um, <clears throat> could be a behavior in terms of the advertiser, or could be a behavior something you're interested in. Um, on the other hand, the visual propaganda is really one-sided. It's made up mostly of non-facts, opinions um, that appear to be facts. It also has emotional appeals a lot of times um, to promote a, a particular desire. But the basic thing is it's one-sided, and it's, it's usually made up of facts. Painting, sculptures, or anything that has a visual component, a movie, television, commercials, political advertising, they're all powerfully in power influences on our attitudes and beliefs. And so that's why visual persuasion is so important to understand it. <clears throat> One thing I did a few years ago was kind of take this apart and think about persuasion in terms of representation, what's being, what's the message that's being told in terms of the idea that's represented, and then looking at it through the medium. <laughs> Excuse you. Um, through a medium such as photography or drawing or graphics, whatever you have, of television, video platforms are things like print, um, a screen, or the web, mobile apps. And so the, uh, what are the purposes that are also tied into this idea of perception and representation? So there's so many factors that are at play when you're talking about somebody's perception in terms of language, gender, race, um, political ideology, all those things fit in. And then we also think about the viewer's perspective. We can think about what Aristotle uh, <clears throat> looked at those three things, the ethos, pathos, and logos. And what he was saying is ethos is the credibility of the source, what you're looking at. So we know that, for instance, Rosie River was part of a large uh, promotional campaign by the U.S. government during World War II to sell war bonds. And so we know that that's, that's a, a good propaganda. It's still the same thing. Does it have credibility? In that sense, it would. Um, pathos, does it have an emotional appeal to it? Yeah, absolutely. So women rolling up her sleeves going to work, you know, for the country. And then logos, does it make sense? Yes. Do the colors and the design make sense? Does the way she looks make sense? Yes, all of those things. So that's one way of, of looking at it. If it didn't, we would call those things noise. If it, it didn't get to the intended purpose of what the image is about. <clears throat> we have a long history of this, moving from oral traditions to textual traditions, and now to visual communication, a visual culture. So <clears throat> advertising, including uh, campaigns like this, are extremely persuasive, and <clears throat> it's based on fact, so it's persuasion even though it looks like it's more propaganda, um, since it has a factual element to it. It's not necessarily um, over the top one side. Anytime you deal with persuasion, you're dealing with the communication that is seeking to change our attitudes or modify our behaviors, things like that. Propaganda or persuasion? Well, because it's a stereotype, of all Muslim men, I would definitely suggest that this is propaganda. So we have an influence model. You can look at it once the influence on the viewer 
and the message. So if I don't understand that method, if I can't decide whether it's propaganda or persuasion, then that would be a noise between the message and the, and the influence. Here's a silly example. Found this today on the web. The image, the representation, is this girl at this house fire. Um, <clears throat> and she has an interesting look on her face. So we look at the media, the medium, newspaper, whether or not we trust the photographer, we trust the newspaper or the delivery system. How do we know it's, it's not Photoshopped? So what's the influence on our perception about this house fire, about this young girl? What do we know about her? She part of this. She set the house on fire. Well, apparently somebody in the, on the online community certainly thinks oh, that she might have something to do with it. So they made a meme out of it, and that totally changes the intent of the, of the picture. So we have here now, we have a media that's still photographed, the medium is digital, and the delivery is the web. So credibility right there is suspect. Now we look at an advertising a lot. So we have this loop going back between the message and then its influence on us. So propaganda, on the other hand, influences the attitudes of the community towards some cause or position by presenting only one side of an argument. It's usually repeated and dispersed over a wide variety of media. They argue their point by claiming the other side is attempting to take away control. <clears throat> Propaganda selects facts selectively, presents them selectively. It loads messages to, to produce an emotional rather than a rational response. <clears throat> its original intent, uh, propaganda the term, was neutral. It could use for um, good things or bad things. But during World War II, um, propaganda became negatively associated with Nazis and the Holocaust. <clears throat> propaganda also deals with um, the use of spoken and pictorial representations. Um, propaganda posters, we started seeing them in the early 20th century. They're visually eye-catching. They symbolize an ideal. They appeal to emotions. They don't usually vilify, vilify whoever they're going after. Um, and they're coded. They have lots of coding in them. So they generate sort of a mimetic, what's called a mimetic desire, right? <clears throat> Some way of in, enticing us. So there's some um, interesting advertising for that's a visual persuasive ad. It's a shopping bag. There's a visual, visually persuasive ad campaign public service announcement for drunk driving. <clears throat> we have to understand that persuasion is a socially accepted way of attempting to change our attitudes and beliefs. Now, <clears throat> the chapter also talks about chalk advertising. The main points here are that they attract attention, they generate controversy, um, <clears throat> they use the slogan, any publicity is good publicity, um, sex sells, humor is a hit, challenge the norms, a deviance versus conformity. <clears throat> There's some ads. So one of the most famous of these shock <clears throat> ad people are from Benetton Colors Magazine. They raise awareness for social issues, but they also make tremendous profits for the company. This is probably the most historic or important um, advertisement for Bennington. It's a news photograph of someone dying of AIDS. There's no caption. We don't know what's going on other than <clears throat> the way that they use this image to promote the product. So very controversial ads. all the way throughout. In terms of visual persuasion, it's nothing new. It was socially acceptable in the 1920s. A sociologist, John Burroughs Hine, would set out to reform the child labor um, use issues in the United States by traveling to all these sites where children were working and no education, working at five, six, seven years old, coal mine textile mills. So they photographed them. Gold miner kids. 
and eventually brought about reforms which led to our public school system that we have today. So Heinz raised awareness about the plight of thousands of children who were working in subhuman conditions, late 19th century, or 19th century, yeah. Um, <clears throat> he was an advocate, so he had credibility, he had ethos, he had logos, because it's a logical argument. And that is emotional. And that's what Aristotle said. There are some more pictures for you. Persuasion or propaganda. So I would lean towards persuasion. This, again, like Rose of the Riveter, the you would deem image shot by Joseph Rosenthal, AP Pulitzer Prize winning picture, was <clears throat> used as a way to sell war bonds. So it was part of a larger propaganda campaign. And then this meme keeps popping up. So there's Uncle Sam and there's uh, the presidential candidate Donald Trump. A stereotype of Japanese, also propaganda. I see this World War II is very famous during the um, <clears throat> war in Iraq. Then, you know, another meme. Okay, well, <clears throat> I hope that um, I hope that works a little bit. I see you stop sharing this and. <clears throat> And I'm hopefully it recorded. So, let's see if I can stop that. All right. Oh, let's stop. All right, so that'll be it for now then.